Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be on resurrections of the Bible. We're going to actually talk about the resurrection of Christ Jesus, the Messiah. So, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 53. You could attend the synagogue for a thousand years, and I doubt you would ever hear this preached or taught. Verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him, who, I believe, the Messiah growing up before him, God the Father, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Uh, we're talking about the uh, whipping that he received prior to the crucifixion. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, at least his physical body. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth. Little note here. Well, let's keep going. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord, God the Father, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteousness, I'm sorry, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, not all, many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Didn't Christ pray for his disciples? Especially Peter, right? Boy, I'll tell you what, I did a video on the life of Peter. I think it's two parts. Um, I, I can relate to Peter more than any of the other apostles. I really can. Uh, but what can I tell you? 
I did a video on where did Jesus go for the three days that he was dead. The Bible declares that he went down to the heart of the earth and there preached unto the spirits in prison. To me, that means he went to a compartment in hell that is known as Abraham's bosom. That's in the book of Luke. All the Old Testament saints went there from the time of Adam to John the Baptist. And Christ went to there and told him, I'm the Messiah, believe on me. And then he took them all into heaven where they are awaiting their resurrection. They're awaiting their new bodies. Now in the Old Testament, people got their old body back. You know, they died, they got their old body back. But when the resurrection comes, people are going to be what they call a celestial body. Right now we have a terrestrial body. You ever heard of the expression uh, on a map, terrain? Well, it has reference to land. We were made of the dust of the earth. Our bodies were anyways. So, but a celestial has reference to above. Terrestrial has reference to below. But seriously, Christ went to uh, Christ went to a compartment in hell for three days and preached. And I guess I'm going to have to do another video on that because I can't find it. I was going to post it and I cannot find it anywhere. I hope it's not one of those videos I lost when the thief in Arkansas stole my computer and everything else I owned. So... Yeah. Yeah, I thought he was a believer and guy started talking about blowing up synagogues. I was like, I got to get out of here. This guy's nuts. You know. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not friends with the ones he wanted to blow up, but uh you know, there's a right way of doing things and then there's a wrong way, and that's the wrong way. The Lord's going to take care of business in his own time, not before. So, all right, let's get going here and take a look. That's the end of Isaiah 53. Jesus was very adamant about his dying. He knew he knew why he came to earth. He came to earth to be a sacrifice. But until that time, he preached the gospel. Okay, I this is probably going to be a long study and probably more than one part. Uh, sorry for being long-winded, but, you know... Things happen. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are considered the Gospels, the good news, because they cover the life of Christ. So, you know, there was some good things I learned in Bible college. Uh, a lot of junk, but there was some good. But I had enough solid foundation and background that I could uh, throw away the garbage and keep the good stuff. So, all right. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. And oh, by the way, um, the historians say that there was no corn in Europe until Columbus went to the, well, after Columbus had gone to the New World, they discovered corn. I don't believe that. I mean, because you read through this and it talks about corn and plucking the ears and, you know, roasting the corn. I, I just don't. Anything the historians tell you, you know, to discredit the Bible, it just, you know, you just realize you're probably talking about a child of the devil, to put it plainly, you know. 
I mean, here it is in verse 1. At the time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. You pluck corn. You know, I mean, and then they'll say, oh, well, they didn't have corn back then. Well, maybe somebody, I'm going to believe the Bible and think they're liars, but you do what you want to do. Verse 2, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto them, Behold, behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Yep. They were worried about being ceremonially, ceremonially unclean for the Passover, but they condemned an innocent man to death. So, yeah, it makes you wonder, you know. But he, Jesus, said unto them, Have ye not read what David did? And when he was unhungered, and they that were with him, how that he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? You know, it's funny, I just listened to this on uh, MP3 in my truck today on the way to the grocery and back. Uh, David was running away from Saul, King Saul, and he went to one of the priests in one of the cities, and um, the he uh, grabbed some of the showbread, which was hallowed bread for the priests, and with some some men, and then he took off, and then King Saul decided. Uh, Hey, wait a minute. You're a traitor. You helped David. I'm trying to kill this guy. Really? King David David killed Goliath and did Israel a service and you're going to kill this guy because you know the Lord departed from Saul and was with David. Boy, I would not want to be Saul on Judgment Day. So what did Saul do? He ordered the death of all the priests that had nothing to do with anything in rebellion against Saul, but he just, they gave David some bread and a sword, the sword of Goliath. And yet Saul said that they were traitors and had them put to death. Wow. You know, it's, it's sad. Jealousy, jealousy is bad. You know, uh, if you're married to somebody and you have a little bit of jealousy, that's good. But when you have jealousy to the point where you're willing to kill somebody over it, that's, yeah, no thanks. Verse 5, Jesus speaking, Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Uh, if there's a baby born, they're to be circumcised on the eighth day. What happens if that's on the Sabbath day? The priest is breaking the Sabbath, right? That's what Jesus is talking about here. The priests were doing the God's, God's work on the Sabbath day, performing sacrifices and what have you. They were working on the Lord's Sabbath day. And yet they're blameless because, you know. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say in, unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. And who is this one that's greater than the temple? Christ! Verse 7. <clears throat> but if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, 
Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Wow. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now, let me tell you something. You think, oh, well, that's not a big deal. You know, it falls into a pit. Uh, you know, I'll just take it out the next day. No big deal, right? Well, during World War I, they built uh, trenches, you know, a, a hole with that was miles long, probably. Guess where the water went when it would rain? Yeah. People were standing in water all day long. And what happened if you had to go to the bathroom? What do you, where do you think that went? And we're talking thousands of men. Do you know what created the most casualties in World War I? Now, let me explain what a casualty is. Obviously, somebody killed is a casualty. But also, somebody that's injured uh, would be considered a casualty too. Especially somebody that was injured that could no longer fight. But the largest cre uh, cause of casualties in World War I was what they called trench foot. If your feet were in standing water 24 hours a day, your feet would rot. Yeah. Look it up. Trench foot. And I think it was General Pershing said uh, to his quartermaster, quartermasters were the ones that uh, brought supplies to the army. Uh, clothing, boots, uh, food on a daily basis, ammunition. That's what the quartermaster did. Well, maybe not ammunition, but everything else. And General Pershing, I think it was, told his quartermaster, I want you to give our men fresh, dry, clean socks every single day or else. And uh, I think clean, dry boots, too. I'm not sure. But uh, that kept our men from getting trench foot, or at least alleviated it, or prevented any new cases. So if the sheep is sitting in a pit with standing water, you know, it's not good for it to sit in standing water. You, you're going to ruin its feet. So that's why you would go into the pit, take the sheep and pull it out. And, uh, you know, there was a reason for that. It's not like, oh, I'll just wait until tomorrow. Today's the Sabbath day. So Jesus said, verse 12, How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Verse 13, Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a counsel against him how they might destroy him. Yeah, Jesus is healing people, and they're jealous, and they want to kill him. I mean, come on. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Isaiah, this is the Greek rendering of Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. Who is the servant? Christ. This is God the Father referencing the Son. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will show judgment to the Gentiles. Same word as nations. Gentiles and nations are same word. Remember when uh, John the Baptist 
was in Jordan River baptizing and Jesus came unto him. And G, uh, John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then Jesus said, Baptize me, John. Well, that's, you know, paraphrasing. But John said, Lord, I have need to be baptized of thee, and you come to me. And then when uh, he was baptized, Christ, the Spirit of God in the shape, bodily shape of a dove came down upon him. Dove means peace, right? There's a that's where it comes from. Doves, meaning peace. So, verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory and in his name jesus and in his name shall the gentiles or the nations trust then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil blind and dumb and he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw and all the people were amazed and said is not this the son of david but when the pharisees heard it they said this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So when you look at Beelzebub, B-E-E-L, that's the Greek rendering of Baal, B-A-A-L, which was a generic name for Lord that became associated with Satanism. And uh, originally it was used in reference to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it became so associated with Satanism that the Lord said, don't call me that anymore. So here it is, the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out devils by the prince of the devils. Verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges." Yeah, I always tell people, get a King James Bible and trust and believe it, people. Read James chapter 1. Ask, for, ask the Lord for wisdom. One of the so-called pillars in the identity movement was uh, Sheldon Emery. And uh, he always preached that uh, who was the children of Israel... And somebody sent me an article where he had, he actually explains away the devil. He actually explains it away. Oh, there is no devil. I mean, really? You, how can you read Revelation chapter 12 and not believe there's a devil? I mean, really? So, I mean, it's just, you know, I wondered, um, do these people even really believe the Bible? Are they set up by the enemy to infiltrate the camp and spread lies? I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying yes, no, maybe. But, uh, you know, one day we're all going to stand before either the judgment seat of Christ as a believer, where we'll be judged for our works, either good or bad, or... We will stand before the white throne judgment as an unbeliever, which is scary, people. There is no second chance. Once you die, that's it. There is no second chance. One of the most important things you could ever do in this life is study the Bible. Read the Bible. You know, I remember when I was on the fence, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, would you... If you're real, 
reveal yourself to me. And boy, he did in a mighty way. Uh, so, not that I'm a pillar of the faith. I've stumbled many times. And uh, I'm ashamed, but, you know, and trust me, I never wanted to be a Bible teacher. Never, never. But I look around and there were so few people teaching the truth. And I thought, if not me, who? Who? It's, it's, it's just a shame. Then you got people like the Sheldon Emery. Oh, there's no devil. What? Really? What got cast out of heaven? Uh, an imaginary being that, you know, what a quack. And this guy is considered a great pillar in the identity community. Shh, unbelievable. So, verse 26, Jesus speaking, and he says, And if Satan cast out Satan, that doesn't exist, according to Sheldon Emery, and if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the Spirit of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. You know, bind him. You got to tie him up and spoiling. You know, you're stealing all his good stuff, right? Verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And I pray that I am helping gather you people, my family, to Christ. Don't ever follow Chaplain Bob unless I'm leading you to Christ. And then quit following me and follow him. Where? Oh, listen to this. 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, I think Mark chapter 3 has a better explanation than this. This is covering the same instance here, to the best of my knowledge. They, the Pharisees that accused Jesus of casting out devils by the devil. Mark 3, 28. Verily I say unto you, Jesus, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. Blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. They accused Jesus of being possessed of a devil. He, they said he had an unclean spirit. They said he was doing his miracles by the power of Satan. I mean, oof. I, and there's only one group of people in this world that teach this in their places of worship. And people wonder why they cannot hear the gospel. Yeah, the you-know-whos. They actually teach this stuff. I've read their writings. So did Martin Luther. Oh, I, they, he, he read their writings. So have I. I went down to the public library and started reading their writings in the reference section of the library in a heavily... Uh, heavily populated section of South Miami where the you-know-whos uh, congregate in a city. And 
read their writings. And you wouldn't believe some of the stuff they believe. I mean, unbelievable. So Jesus says in verse 33, Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Verse 34, who's he talking to here? Not the Greeks. Oh, generation of vipers. What is a viper? It's a, a very venomous type of snake. Vipers are extremely venomous. Uh, let me look up some vipers, common vipers. In the United States, a uh, rattlesnake is a type of viper, but perhaps you've heard of uh, pit vipers. So let me see if I can find out. Uh, I'll take a look. Oh, okay, boy, there's some nasty ones. Uh, puff adders, pit vipers like rattlesnakes, cotton mouse, copperheads, the gaboon viper, green vipers, and horned vipers. Uh, yeah, there's some nasty ones here. All right, so let's take a look. Matthew 12, 34. Words of Christ in red. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man... Out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So, will you acknowledge Christ, or will you not acknowledge Christ? In the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 8, words of Christ in red, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. In other words, confess Jesus is Lord. Verse 9, But he that denieth me before men, shall be denied before the angels of God. Wow. Uh, verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the sin of Gog's, and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Hmm. So, Matthew 12, 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Oh yeah, we want to see a magic trick. Verse 39. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. You know, Jonah, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is what, this is that three days that Christ went to Abraham's bosom, under, you know, hell's below, heaven's above. And he's going to preach unto the spirits in heaven for three days. 
And people are freaking out. Oh my God, Jesus went to hell? Well, Abraham's bosom was a compartment in hell. I guess you could say it was the non-smoking section. You know, from fire. Yeah. All right, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Hmm. Uh, where did Jesus go to preach to the spirits in prison? Hell was prison. Verse 20. Which sometimes were disobedient, but once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth now also now uh, save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Jesus said he was going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, that's not heaven, people. So right here, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. See, hell was created for the devil and his angels. We were never supposed to go there. Never. That wasn't the original plan. But when Adam and Eve sinned, well, things changed. All right, back to Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, uh, wait a minute, did I read 39? 39. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, and I did a Bible study on that, and let me tell you something. Jonah is not some children's fairy tale. Yeah, there's some scientific evidence. Did you know there was a guy who was... Uh, Swallowed, he was a whaler back in the turn of the century. Uh, whale oil, whale blubber was what they used to uh, light the homes. They almost uh, exterminated the whales into extinction because they were hunted relentlessly. And there was a guy in a whaling ship, and the, um, the guy was in a, uh, I don't know what you call it, not the main ship. But in a little, I don't know, maybe a 15, 20 foot boat, you know, a rowboat out in the ocean. And they were trying to retrieve this, uh, this whale that was badly injured. And the whale hit the boat and a guy went overboard and he got swallowed by the whale. And I think the, if I remember correctly, the name of the ship the main ship was the eastern star i think this guy was in the whale's belly for two and a half days well they continued hunting this injured whale they finally killed it and when they brought it uh alongside the ship and tied it up and started cutting it open and taking the um the whale blubber the oil the fat they saw movement in the stomach well, guess what? They cut open the whale's stomach to see what, what it was, and their missing crewman was in the bell, belly of this whale. He was there for two and a half days. His skin was bleached white from the uh, gastric juices, the acid in the whale's stomach. And uh, he recounted how it was like living in, uh, it was hot. Because a, a whale is a mammal, and they produce body heat. And, uh, I mean, can you imagine being swallowed by a whale? And uh, total darkness. 
This guy was freaking out. And he kind of went into shock for a while, but then eventually he revived. And this was written up in a um, newspaper article. So, you know, uh, they don't want this kind of information to get out. So, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, guess what? Earth, the heart of the earth is not heaven, people. All right, verse 41. And I remember Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire that took part of Judah and Israel into captivity. So, and guess what their god was? Dagon. Do you know what Dagon was? He was from the waist down a fish and from the waist up a man. You want to know what Dagon looked like? Take a look at uh, Disney's Little Mermaid. There you go. That's what Dagon looked like. Well, her what's her? Ariel, her father. Yeah. So when uh, the whale went up on the shore at Nineveh and spit out Jonah, you know, the fishermen that were on the shore said, oh my, oh my, a prophet of Dagon has come unto us. And you think they didn't follow him to the capital and tell the king or whatever that a prophet had been spit out by a fish by our god Dagon? And what did, and what did, Jonah preached. He preached repentance to these people. So, verse 41. Yeah, I'd cover that in my Jonah study. Uh, believe it or not, that was one of the first studies I ever did uh, on this channel. Verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment of this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Remember the man at the tombs that was possessed of devils? And Jesus asked him what? The name of the devil was, and he says, We are legion, for we are many. Yeah. Verse 46, Matthew 12. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one of them uh, said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. And that is the end of chapter 12 of the book of Matthew. So I guess uh, it's been 45 minutes. I guess this is a good time to pause and um, well I guess this is going to be part one of the resurrection of Jesus this uh, series of studies is just going to be on the resurrection of Christ that's it maybe I'll redo the uh, where Christ went for three days and three nights to preach unto the spirits of uh, the in prison I don't know what happened to that study no idea Maybe it was on my old uh, old computer that the guy stole. 
uh, well, the Lord's going to, may the Lord look upon us and judge between the two of us. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.